This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Good morning and thanks for listening. This is Relatively Speaking, the show all about you and your family. And I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. So, question for you. Do you think that you or someone you love has ADHD? That's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And it's the most common brain health disorder in children and um, persists for many into adulthood. In fact, research on ADHD is booming still. By the end of 2017, there were over 31,000 research studies and papers published in medical journals about this incredibly common childhood disorder. It now, we believe, affects an estimated 1 in 12 kids and teens and persist in many adults and thought to be about 1 in 25 adults. So um, research is ongoing in that area looking. It has nothing to do with intelligence, but like I said, left untreated a lot to do with success and failure. So I'm delighted today to have psychologist Dr. Dustin Sarver, who is going to help us navigate through this. Good morning, Dr. Sarver. How are you? Hey, good morning, Dr. Buttress. It's such a pleasure to be on. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, good to have you back. As always, you do such a great job. So, And I know I want to talk about some of your work in the area of of ADHD. Before we get to that, though, I just wanted to, for the listening audience, review a couple of things. Um, One, I think most people have heard of ADHD. It's a disorder of inattention impulsivity, and for some individuals, hyperactivity. And there is some thought that everybody has a little bit of that underlying um, component, but um, some much, much more than others. Um, So the other thing I want to just put out there is I want everybody to know what ADHD is not. It is not dyslexia. It is not a problem with intelligence at all. It's not a depression or anxiety. It is not a sleep disorder. It is a disorder that has been shown to have a neurochemical basis um, in the brain that affects executive function, processing, and uh, concentration. So when a child has problems with inattention or hyperactivity at home and in the classroom or in child care, there are so many things that have to be ruled out before you can rule in ADHD. Now, there are tests. Um, there are psychological tests. There are rating scales out there. Many people know about all of that. There's not a blood test, though, not as of yet. There's not genetic testing as of yet. There's a lot of research in that area. The issue for making sure you are ruling out all the other disorders um, that can cause inattention or learning or concentration in, in children is even more important for adults because the potential of health problems mount, other issues can come into play, thyroid disorders, vitamin deficiencies, even bigger sleep problems, other chemical issues can come into play, and certainly there's substance abuse, alcohol and, and illicit or illicit drugs um, can certainly affect ADHD. So I wanted to throw all that out there and make sure, listeners, that as you are navigating through your life with your family, your children, or yourself, um, trying to decide, is, is this ADHD? Obviously, you need to have a good professional 
who knows their topic, knows it well, and is not just someone who will write a prescription if you walk into the room and exam room and say, I think I'm having problems paying attention. I think I need Adderall. That's not what should happen. Good medical care means really good medical care, and that means making sure you know what you're treating. The old ways of, oh, let's give it a try and see if it helps, should should really be out the door. We should never just give it a try without really investigating first. A big part of medicine and psychology is, is really investigating, being a detective, making sure you know what you're dealing with. So, Dr. Sarver, I'm going to throw that to you and see if you want to add anything that I said before we start um, talking a little bit about the, the new stuff that's out there. Yes, I'd love to underscore a few things that I also might also throw that it is not. It is not a learning problem. You right. can have learning problems in addition to that or separately. It is also not um, something that has to do with um, auditory functioning, uh, meaning that you know you can't quite hear. It's something that I think you make it a good, uh, great point. It is a neurodevelopmental issue. It means these kids on average, um, tend to be about two years behind in, in, develop, in neurodevelopment on, the, on, their, on their brains. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely something that's interesting that, uh, you know, affects a lot of kids, and we probably all either know someone uh, or uh, uh, within our, you know, arm's reach of, of our influence um, who's been affected by this in some way. Right. So, listeners, if you have any questions about ADHD or comments or thoughts or experiences that you have gone through, please give us a call at 877-MPB-RING. That's 1-877-672-7464, or you can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. So uh, a, a couple of things that I really want us to cover today are some of the things that um, is out there that people say, some of the things that are out there that, that people say that can be really hurtful to individuals with ADHD. Um, I've, it, people acting as if it is a problem with just not being quite smart enough um, and like a problem with uh, not being motivated enough or issues such as that. So I want to make sure that, that as we're moving along, we, we remind people, when you say things to people who have ADHD, you have to realize that they're people, they have feelings, especially with the commonness of this disorder. If you say something, you are li- about ADHD or your belief or non-belief in it, which, by the way, you saw 31,000 research articles um, that are out there, um, know, know that there's somebody around you who is dealing with this disorder and, and who Nobody wants a disorder, right? Nobody wants to have to deal with something that perhaps makes you feel different. So you want to make sure that you're sensitive about that as you're moving along. Um, Let's go on to our first caller. We have Elizabeth in Jackson. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for calling. Good morning. Thanks for taking my call. Absolutely. Um, I have a child in elementary school who um, is diagnosed ADHD. It does happen to run in our family and um, they are they are taking medication and it seems to work really well. We're very happy with the um, health care that we've received around their ADHD. But what I'm curious about is are there um, services or resources, particularly um, you know, in the in the metro area, um, that we could tap into that would help teach my child some um, focus skills and organizational skills. I feel like while the medication does help, um, they would really benefit from someone who could kind of coach them through um, some specific strategies, maybe to to help them stay organized with schoolwork and and that sort of thing that I just don't feel equipped to do. 
Well, thank you for asking that question, Elizabeth, because that is absolutely something we want to talk about. Whenever there's ADHD, it's very important to remember behavioral intervention is an important large part of the treatment and sometimes can be the only treatment. So, Dr. Sarver, I'm throwing this over to you because I know this is your bailiwick and you want to talk about it. Yes, thank you so much. That's a great question, um, uh, Elizabeth. So there are multiple um, available resources um, that I would might point folks um, who are in your similar situation to. The first is, while it's not a uh, local resource, is um, there's a lot of great information about what to look out for um, that's uh, affiliated with the National ADHD uh, uh, organi- um, Advocacy Organization called CHAD, C-H-A-D-D. And you just go to chad.org. There's lots of a wealth of information about those things. Um, there's a, uh, several other programs that are widely available, and we now know that are great for um, helping kids build out their executive function skills and organization skills training. Um, a few of the ones that I, I've used, personally used myself um, for, for treatment of, uh, of some families uh, and kids are involve um, something called the organizational skills training for kids. Uh, it's a protocol developed by a uh, psycho- two parapsychologists um, um, in New York, um, Howard Abakoff and Richard Gallagher, um, and it's just literally organizational skills training for ADHD. It is wonderful. It's a really great thing. It's not widely disseminated out here, but this is where I think it's wonderful to have a conversation with your therapist or, or with a counselor, and um, they can often, t- I encourage parents that whenever they seek something that has evidence and it's not available or maybe the clinician doesn't know, to give that information to the clinician and ask them to walk you through it. Because a, a most competent clinician can look at these evidence-based models and, uh, and, and protocols and books and help lead families into it. It just might take them a, a quick prep uh, on that. But I really love the uh, organizational skills training. There's another one for teenagers by um, one of my colleagues. Uh, uh, Margaret Sibley, um, S-I-B-L-E-Y, and she has something called the Supporting Teens Autonomy Daily, or the STAND program. It really helps about both um, kind of make, maintaining uh, organization and building up your, uh, yourself, as well as some um, uh, school performance and emotional regulation types of things. So I would point to those two programs, and they're widely available. There's some books. There's even some parent books you can just Google up on Amazon or eBay. Um, but I would really point to those two as like some of the most um, cutting edge, you know, evidence based, really good, um, and kind of easy to understand. And I think that's a good thing. Um, but what the caution I might give to you is that anytime you're going down any of these behavioral routes, it's going to be about practice, 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 and um, really making sure you're doing it consistently and um, and as best you can. Otherwise, the kind of program will can fall apart. But if you're doing it and you're really putting uh, making it consistent, uh, consistent, most kids will experience some uh, improvement. So, Dr. Sarver, thank you. And, Elizabeth, what we will do, because that was a lot of good information and other listeners, Dr. Sarver, if you will give us the websites where our um, listeners can get that information, we will put it on our website. So we're going to take our first break. Stephen, hang on. When we get back, we will come to you. Um, ADHD is what we are talking about. The promising research, the new treatments, just general recommendations or any thoughts or questions you have. Give us a call, 1-877-MPB-RING. That's 877-672-7464. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. Welcome back, and thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Dustin Sarver, and we're talking about ADHD across the lifespan. 
Um, whether you have it or someone you love, let's talk about what's going on. You can call us at one eight seven seven MPB ring. That's eight seven seven. Six seven two seven four six four, or you can send an email to family at mpbonline dot org. We're going to go back to the phone. Stephen's been patiently waiting in Corinth. Hey, Stephen, thanks for calling. Good morning. Um, what I wanted to bring up first, I wanted to share an experience I had with uh, children um, that were being labeled with that. Le- leading up to a question, I will finish it off with about. Roughly, I guess, 17, maybe 18 years ago, I got involved in the AmeriCorps No Child Left Behind program, and I was hired in as a tutor uh, at one of the schools in Corinth. Uh, And I was asked to uh, take one-on-one these uh, kindergarten, first and second graders. That was the age bracket, just one at a time, uh, uh, taking those students that were struggling Try, uh, keeping up with the rest of the class, their grades or their behavior, whatever was involved with it, and uh, taking them one-on-one either over in a corner of the classroom or out in the hallway, setting up a desk, and going over the same material that the teacher was going over with in the classroom. Okay, this, this went on. Um, I, I did it for that one semester, and um, I had no problem with any of these students at all And I was tutoring them with the same material. And after about six to eight weeks, um, somewhere in there, I walked into the hallway and one of those teachers grabbed me respectfully by the shirt collar and yanked me into her classroom and pointed her finger down at the grade book and said, what are you doing? And I said, what are you talking about? She said the grades, she showed me the grades went from failing up to uh, some excelling and some just really jumped up in their grade levels, and I said, I'm just taking the material you're teaching and uh, doing it exactly the way you would do it, but what I realized was that these children with this one-on-one attention, where their behavior was changing, they were calming down, and they were feeling like they were being listened to. Mm -hmm. What a difference that makes in a child. And it occurred to I was starting hearing bits and pieces of some of their home life. And when a child is growing up in a very disruptive home where parents are always fighting or a, or a single-parent home where there's a lot of shuffling around, going house to house, while that single parent is trying to make a living, having to pick up that child late at night and bring them home, their night sleep is disruptive. But when that child feels like they're being listened to, their, their grades, I'm not saying this to sound like a bragging at all. She showed me those grades, and I said a big part of this was being able to simply slow the teaching down one-on-one right. on one with that child. Right. But great point. Every child does not learn the same. Every child yeah. does not need the same input. So you're you're bringing up how important a teacher can be, and and that's something that as we talk through this, um, sometimes children will have no problems, and then get to a grade and suddenly start having problems. Now, could it be ADHD? Yes. Could it be teaching style? Yes. And so, Stephen, you're bringing up some points that as we move along, we need to talk more about. Um, I I will say, and then I I want Dr. Sarver to talk about something, some research that he did back several years ago on sort of cutting-edge squirm-to-learn stuff that he'll talk about in a minute. One of my granddaughters came home from school the other day and commented about how much she loved her teacher. And her her mother said, well, tell me about what's going on. And she said, we have dance time every hour. So once an hour, the teacher has the whole class stand up and jiggle around and jump around and dance to music. She plays music. It lasts for 10 minutes. Um, everybody has a great time, and then they sit back down and engage again. And so there is research out there 
that says why this is so awesome to do. And Dr. Sarver was one of the one of the leading researchers in this area. So, Dr. Sarver, why don't you talk about this for us, if you will, just for a minute? Sure, absolutely. And Stephen, uh, if I could just underscore, you raise a lot of good points about like how being in that one-on-one environment, you're able to provide a lot of, it sounds like a lot of structured and uh, experiences and Mm -hmm. and you really um, individualized learning support that you gave to those kids. And that's that's two hallmarks that are very key in helping um, uh, produce improved grades and and performance among um, uh, these kids and uh, adolescents. And I I think one of the individualized learning supports or allowances that you can permit kids with um, ADHD to do is to move around when they're doing this. You know, the expectation in classrooms is to kind of sit still, put your feet on the floor, and pay attention. And that's unfortunately not um, an expectation that most individuals with ADHD or most kids with ADHD specifically um, are, are able to to do for long periods of time and that can be detrimental to learning because then they're learning to or they're uh, concentrating on keeping their you know seat in the in the chair and their feet on the floor rather than attending to the work and one of the things that but doing that one-on-one and individualized learning that you sounds like you're doing is really comports with a lot of the research that we um, that's coming out showing that like that movement and allowing kids to move and not as long as it's not disruptive, um, whether that's standing standing up or giving the freedom to move around while they're actively learning can actually allow their working memories to work more efficiently. And work memory is just a specialized part of your brain that allows you to both hold on to things and kind of work with it at the same time. So we see that most, about a little over half to three quarters or two thirds of kids um, will have some beneficial experience with that. And um, it's certainly an individualized plan and recommendation that a lot of families uh, could choose to do in terms of if they have a 504 or an individualized education plan. And particularly if they're working with um, tutors or um, aides in the uh, same way that you were with those kids in corn. Right. So, well, Stephen, thank you for your work with children. I bet you made a huge difference in many children's lives. So thank you for that call. It was very, very rewarding. It was really rewarding. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Well, I, I just, listeners, I would love to hear experiences, good or bad, in, in the classroom or outside. So join in the conversation or any questions that you have, either with medication or behavioral treatment, give us a call at one eight seven seven mpb ring That's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. So, yeah, I just want to emphasize the activity component and how important that is again. Um, One of the things that happens so many times to children with ADHD who have difficulty finishing their work is they get kept in during recess to complete their work. Bad idea. It's probably one of the worst things that can happen to a child with ADHD because then they still don't get to get up and move around and get that heart rate up and get that exercise. Um, so do not, if, if your child has ADHD and they're not completing things, certainly you need follow through. You need a good behavioral plan and a reinforcement plan. Rewards are helpful, right? to help you get them to accomplish something. Rules are fine. Um, but do not take, my, my thought is, unless you have to, do not take sports away, do not take recess away, do not take outdoor activity away. If you take something away, take away electronics, um, take away the television, take away that cell phone, but do not take away their sports and their exercise. I don't know, Dustin, you may have some comments on that, and I'd like for you to talk about some of the other, the the behavioral techniques that parents can use at home. You talked a little bit about the organizational skills, but any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, there's just a lot. Um, of course, we know that moving around, being active, um, not just in the kind of fidgetiness, but also more at large scale in terms of your exercise and fitness and 
uh, and kind of overall physical well-being is so important as a lifestyle factor. And, you know, some of the research that um, I've even, I'm doing currently right now is showing that only about 1% of uh, kids uh, uh, with ADHD compared to about 10% of kids uh, in the uh, teens to the teens in the nation actually get the recommended amount of sleep, physical activity, and like um, low uh, electronics exposure per day. And so we're talking, so there, it, I think your point's perfect is that we don't want to give those things up. We want to encourage them because we know those things are linked to better um, outcomes later on, certainly better phys- physical health, but the emotional and, and uh, mental health um, well-being that can, it can provide is so well documented. Uh, and there's even some of, the, some of the really cool evidence that I've been able to see come out recently is that it's looking like maybe even some degree of uh, in- engagement in, uh, you know, daily, uh, moderate or vigorous uh, physical activity can actually have long-term in- benefits for protecting against uh, uh, inattention symptoms. So it might be able to actually reduce the level of ADHD symptoms in kids later on uh, when they get into the teenage years. So um, again, it's something that we, we can do um, as, you know, as parents is to inc- uh, include, is help kids get out there and do those things. And, and, you know, the other thing that that does provide is it provides a lot of social interaction, which um, individuals with ADHD, uh, on the whole, some of them can be, some people can be very sociable and, and, and connecting with others, but there's a, a good proportion of kids who struggle with that. And allowing them to be a part of all those activities um, uh, really helps the opportunity to practice and be a part of that and being connected, whereas if we were to remove them uh, from that, you know, it can limit the number of uh, chances they have time to connect and feeling lonely or isolated and right. we're not practicing social skills and um, you know so I, I really uh, think those are very very valuable tools to keep in our parenting um, uh, and even classroom toolbox yeah absolutely I think sometimes we forget socialization is one of the really important pieces of learning in school learning how to socialize with others okay we are going to take our next break and when we get back Roger Hang on, we'll be right with you, and you can call too. We've got open lines. Please join in the conversation about ADHD, what to do, what not to do, how to treat. Give us a call, one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464. We will be right back. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Welcome back and thanks for listening. Um, We are talking about ADHD. I am Dr. Susan Buttress here with Dr. Dustin Sarver. And we are going to go right back to the phones. Hi, Roger. Good morning. Thanks for calling. Thank you for the wonderful program and your guest speaker was so so valuable. He brought up several things and used the term IEP, Individualized uh, Education Education. Plan. Uh Uh, My background, I'm retired now for several years. I was an attorney and a state court trial judge, and then I did administrative law judge work for the Department of Education. Hearing cases which under federal law, parents have the opportunity to file a complaint if their child who has a learning disability or similar uh, afflictions uh, is not getting uh, attention or or education. And so we have to have a hearing. And so that's that's what we did. It was extremely interesting. A lot lot less stressful for the administrative judge than the a trial <laughs> on the bench. Right. But the interesting thing is that in counties, some, there are some counties, some school districts, who simply do not have the tax base to provide the attention that these children need. The teachers and administrators may try to put together an IEP for an individual child, but what that child has MS and requires a $20,000 specialized budget to they can mm-hmm. use their mouth to write with, etc. Et well, what if the child, what's re- what if really needed is 
two, not one, two or three uh, teacher assistants in a classroom so that you can take a child out in the hall, let him jump around a little bit because he has a- AED. I mean, uh, well, whatever the... ADHD, uh, right. Sorry. Yeah. But these school districts can't afford that. My question is, but if anybody's listening, call your representative and find out. Why isn't there some way that the State Department of Education can use public funds from the general fund, taxpayers' money, to aid those counties which would qualify under any simple analysis for aid, special aid, to provide these things that these kids need? Yeah. Roger, you're you're making some great points. Um, certainly, first of all, we have a bunch of independent school districts. Right now, the State Department of Education um, has little power other than making sure that the schools are following federal guidelines. But as far as what each individual school uses or school district uses, as you know this, I'm just saying this for our listeners, What they use for um, in their school district, they could spend half their money on administration and and have so not so much left for children. I'm not saying that happens, but there is evidence that in an occasional school district that does happen. So, uh, yeah, the the State Department of Education has has little power. Um, right now, the way things are set up, the each school district is basically responsible for taking care of their children. Um, there is an individualized education plan. Many children with ADHD do not qualify for an IEP, but they may for a 504 plan. The problem with a 504 plan is that for if you qualify for that, that's great. The schools don't get any additional money to implement that. Um, I think one point I want to emphasize, um, large classrooms with one teacher are the worst things for children with ADHD. And you, you said it. If we could only have at least two assistants for every classroom, if we've got to have it at the size of 25 or 30, have two assistants in the classroom. So I think you've made, you've made several good points, and, and I, I agree with you. It would be nice to make sure the money is going where it's needed for the children who are in need for that support. So... Roger, thank you for that. That's, I think, kind of rhetorical questions. Other than um, your point, talk to your legislator. Talk to them about what you think your schools need and what is missing. So um, with that, I think we've got, we've got a full board. I want to move to our next caller. Roger, thanks for calling in. Uh, the next, I believe, is Weston in Oxford. Hi, Weston. Hi. What are your thoughts? Talk to us. Um, well, one, I want to go ahead and thank Roger for pointing out those issues in our, in our education system. It's something, just if there are any representatives listening, I, I think that teachers deserve more pay, and I hear that every time an election cycle comes up, it's something, but there are many more issues in our education system that need to be addressed other than just teacher pay, and I think one of those is what Roger, Roger just said. But what I was really calling about was really just I was a student uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD, mild symptoms at a very young age, and I just want to kind of caution parents against not taking that seriously because my own father really did not do anything, and it caused a lot of problems down the road. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons that you don't want to say that your kid has a disability or a learning issue, and for every person it might be different, but you know, the, the, the point is that the experts know what they're talking about, and when they say that, you really do need to address it, um, whether you choose medication or behavioral therapies, you know, that's up to you and your child and the expert that you're talking to, and, and it sounds like there's a lot of good advice here. Um, and then the other one was I, I noticed that you, um, you made a suggestion not to limit physical activity, but you did suggest 
taking away electronics. And this isn't really an ADHD issue, but it might be sort of a generational thing. Um, you know, I was in middle school when the transition from MySpace to Facebook was going on, so it wasn't as a big deal for me. You know, social media wasn't a big deal. Uh, well, it was starting to be. But nowadays, a lot of kids, especially since the pandemic started, that is how they socialize. And I don't think it's a bad idea to limit electronics, but it's something that I think parents should be aware of that, a lot of their child socialization with their peers at this point in time is going to be through an electronic format. And so we should definitely keep in mind that, you know, a total prohibition of those sorts of things might not be the best idea. Of course, there's other issues like cyberbullying and spending too much time, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to control the content that's exposed to your children. But, you know, it, it, I can tell you that even now as an adult, since I haven't been able to be in person with a lot of my friends, if I wasn't able to contact them electronically, it would have definitely made this past year much, much, much more difficult. So it's something to keep in mind. Oh, that's a really great point, Weston. And and so probably limit it um, is is a better word than taking away um, and in fact, the way I like to use electronics for children, especially when you're trying to limit it, is you can use it as a reward. Uh, you're right. Um, it's, it's a socialization tool. It's probably saved some children and adults from terrible loneliness. And so to, to keep that in mind, use it as a reward. Um, allow, don't, and if you put it in a positive mode that this is the reward for finishing your work in a timely fashion rather than it's a punishment I'm taking it away is, is certainly just feels better in general. So thanks for bringing that up. And, you know, you did bring up something I want to emphasize. If whether or not it's medication or behavioral treatment or medication and behavioral treatment, if you just address it, if there's a problem, that's what's so very important because what happens for individuals if they struggle and struggle is either they give up and drop out or they turn to self-medication, alcohol or substance abuse. And that's something that um, you just don't want. You don't want people to struggle like that. So, Weston, thank you for, for those comments. I really appreciate it. All right, I think we'll move to, I believe, is it Jane um, in Clinton? Hi, Jane. Hello. How, how are you? Good. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Okay, you're welcome. You know, um, one, one problem that I've encountered with my boy, with one of my sons, is left-handedness. Now, that is not a disability. No. But <laughs> when he was in school, his strong left-handedness prevented him from hardly learning how to print and write because all the desks were for right-handed students. And I even thought about buying a desk for him in school and just moving it from class to class because he struggled with scissors and just... Because of his left-handedness, it was almost a disability, and nobody really cares about that at all. So I'm hoping that schools will consider putting in maybe two or three left-handed desks for those kids. Um, so That's they, interesting. They, so they, they should. don't have to struggle. Yeah. That's a struggle right there. Yeah. And um, it's a struggle that they deal with as a common problem in their whole life. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, some there are desks now that you know are either right-handed or left-handed. I think now what what many have tried uh, to do is have desks that are interchangeable. But if they're not, um, certainly as a parent, you have the right to go into the school and ask for that accommodation. And the school should be able to address that. Now, Roger brought up um 
if the, a child is having problems and you want it to be addressed, what you can do is call a teacher support team meeting. It doesn't mean necessarily that that child will qualify for services, but to call a meeting, ask everybody to sit down and talk about what the problems are and see if those can be addressed. Um, in impoverished schools, perhaps, they might have a difficult time buying the correct kind of desk, but what about just switching the child to a flat table so that they can do that. But you're right, it's tough to to write if you can't don't have a place to rest your hand in the proper fashion. Um, so, Jane, you know, the, the truth is, is that there's been some research that has said that left-handed people maybe learn languages more easily or accomplish some skills more easily. So that's that's interesting. It should never be viewed as a disability. So, all right, Jane, thanks for that call. I, we're going to go to our final break, and when we come back, um, Liza, we will be with you, but we do have open lines, so feel free to give us a call. If you have a comment or a question, that's um, one eight seven seven mpb ring um, and, or you can send us an email to family at mpbonline.org. We will be right back. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome back and thanks for listening. I am Susan Buttress here with Dr. Dustin Sarver and we are talking about ADHD anything you want to know about it. So we still have a moment. Give us a call, one eight seven seven mpb ring That's 877-672-7464 if you have a question. Um, we are going to go to Liza in Louisville, Louisville. Hi, Liza. Thanks for calling. Hey there. I was um, just wanting to comment on the first caller about local resources. Um Something that she could look into would be occupational therapy, either through the school or at an outpatient clinic, because occupational therapists can address um, attention and organizational skills and different sensory things that could be going on and help kind of create a plan for that child to be able to participate better. Good information. I know there are some occupational therapists who are well trained in the in that area. Dr. Sarver, any comments to um, Liza or the audience on that? Yeah, I, I, while we certainly know sensory issues can be correlated with ADHD, I do want to just kind of have a caution that some, it can sometimes be ascribed to ADHD right. um, and say that that's causing ADHD. And I'll be very cautious about that approach. Now, I do I, I do agree with you. There's definitely some occupational therapists who are well-trained, and as long as they're focusing on providing the skills training of organization and kind of maybe a comp, uh, looking for sensory things that might be interfering, um, but that I feel like that's a safe place to be just um, uh, for that. So whether that's kind of looking at the environment, is there too much stimulation, not enough stimulation, things like that can be really um, uh, uh, helpful and beneficial uh, looking at an individualized plan. Right. Um, some And you know what? You just mentioned something that I wanted to throw out there. Um, some children really do have a lot of trouble just blocking out even minor distractions. And so there are some accommodations that can be made, like noise canceling, um, earphones, headphones, and things such as that. So to keep in mind, if, if there are continued problems and you think you've pulled out all the stops, to Go to a professional, ask for some of the additional accommodations that can be made or changes. Um, testing in a quiet place so that a child is not having to worry about somebody next to them tapping tapping their pencil or shaking their floor or shaking their leg. Sometimes that can be just a huge distractor. So, um, Liza, thank you for that. Again, like Dr. Sarver said, we want to make sure that those individuals are well-trained in, in how to help behaviorally with the ADHD treatment. 
Okay, we have time to get to our last caller, Mary in Gulfport. Hi, Mary. Thanks for calling. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I have an adult daughter who was never diagnosed with ADHD as a a child. Uh, Later on, as she um, graduated from college, she has been diagnosed. What kind of help is available for adults who have never been treated? So that's interesting, Mary. So she was able to get through high school and college um, and um, and then was diagnosed. I'm curious as to what led her to be diagnosed. I think what happened is she started having problems at work with concentrating and focusing on what needed to be done. And uh, she decided to go see somebody, and they tested her, and sure enough, what she says, off the charts. Hmm. Well, you know, did did she have the same kind of problems in high school and college? Not as much. She, she had a sibling who was um, severely ADHD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so, of course, you know. Yeah. So, you know, um, it's it's curious that she was diagnosed um, after uh, she finished college. I know it can happen. Certainly it can be missed. Yep. And many times yep. individuals who are very bright can can get by um, without a huge amount of concentration because they're very bright and they're able to absorb things rapidly and the like. Um I would want to make sure, I'm just going to throw a caution out there, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sarver for the last minute to talk to us about what other resources, but want to make sure she's getting plenty of sleep, there are no substances involved, there are no other health issues. As I mentioned at the beginning of the show, whenever you have an adult, you want to make sure that it's not... A uh, psychologist making the diagnosis without having a medical provider really looking into what else might be going on so that we know she needs to be getting at least seven to eight hours of sleep, that we want to make sure nutritionally everything's good and the like. So, Dr. Sarver, I'm going to give you about a minute to talk uh, about other potential services. Sure. Yeah. So there's a lot of good things out there. One is certainly a medication, if that's appropriate, talking with their doctor can be um, very helpful for adults. Uh, some of the basic things that we do um, with kids, we just adultify them in some ways of so providing the organizational skills training, um, but for how it looks like in terms of keeping charts and, um, and, and making a skill for plan that can certainly have people be uh, counselors walk through that with um uh, adults as well. Um, I also like to make sure that, you know, and especially as she, uh, people who are young, that, you know, we are, that they can navigate themselves into a career or job that um, that fits with them in terms of their schedule and their ability and just kind of natural rhythm of concentration. Uh, that might be more independent work, so there's a really goodness of fit there. And sometimes whenever that, you know, that independence versus having to be keep structured is, uh, you know, grinds against each other, that can produce some uh, uh, not good um, and more stressful environments. So uh, those are things just in very in the kind of brief time here, those are, the, you know, stress and things like that or uh, management would be another thing I would throw in there. But those are the really big things mm-hmm. I think of that are really important for adults. Well, I just want to thank all of our callers and listeners, and I certainly want to thank you, Dr. Sarver. As always, you're a great help with a plethora of information. We will have websites. That CHAD website is a great one. It has questions there about medication. I want to make sure you take a look at that, listeners. If you'd like to hear the show again or any past episodes, listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast app by searching Southern Remedy Relatively speaking. This show is a production of MPB Think Radio, engineered by Java Chapman. Uh, Call screener was Jay White. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress. I hope you'll join us um, next week and stay tuned for Here Now coming up next on MPB Think Radio.